Okay, so now um, we have a panel discussion on advances in surgical care of the oncology patient. And I'd like to welcome all our panelists. This is a really wide uh, range of specialties. Dr. Richard Alexander is the chair. Uh, and joining him is Dr. Joseph uh, Benavenia, Dr. Tony Beninato, Dr. James Akins, Dr. Richard Lazaro, and uh, Dr. Manpreet Kohli. So um, why don't each of you um, introduce yourselves and um, give your specialties, and then I'll let you take it away, Rich. Great. We'll start down there. Oh, starting down here. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Preeti Kohli. I'm a, a breast surgeon, the director of breast surgery at Monmouth Medical Center. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Can't wait to share all the exciting things that we do in the OR. Hi, um, my name is uh, Joe Benavenia. I'm a musculoskeletal oncologist at orthopedic surgeon uh, based out of uh, Newark at the New Jersey Medical School, and I'm uh, privileged to be here. Uh, hi, my name is James Akins. I'm a gynecologic oncologist, and I'm based in CINJ, New Brunswick. Hi, Tony Beninato. Uh, I'm an endocrine surgeon uh, in New Brunswick. Richard Lazaro, thoracic surgery, southern region. Good morning. Richard Alexander. I'm the chief surgical officer, and I'm a GI surgical oncologist uh, located here in New Brunswick and also down in uh, Monmouth. We have a little bit of a crowded next 40 minutes. There's a lot to talk about in surgical oncology, and I hope that the take-home message for all of you that are here today is that within our system, we really have a remarkable core of cancer surgeons who share uh, qualities and values around providing excellence in service, innovation in research, and a commitment to education. Um, it's a hard job for me to pick uh, representatives uh, from various specialties across our system to speak today, but we have a very good crew. And I've asked each one of them in their various specialties to talk a little bit about the major advances that have occurred in their fields and specialties that are relevant to the care of the cancer patient. We're going to start this morning uh, with Joe Benavinia. Uh, Joe is the head of our musculoskeletal oncology program. He is based at the New Jersey Medical School in Newark, New Jersey. He's the head of the Department of Orthopedics. He's a nationally known internationally known uh, expert in the management of patients with musculoskeletal uh, tumors, and we're delighted to have him. Joe, welcome to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Now, I, I, what I'd like to do, I'm going to just show you some pictures, because um, in uh, orthopedics and uh, in surgery, they, uh, they're like the common language. Um, there's a few things that you know I'd like to make everybody aware of that we're doing um, now in, uh, in orthopedics. Okay, so what do we treat in orthopedic oncology, uh, just so that everybody who is not familiar with it, we treat primary tumors. Of, uh, for example, the most common is probably osteosarcoma, and this is in conjunction usually with medical uh, pediatric oncology for neoadjuvant therapy. Soft tissue sarcomas, uh, very similar, also neoadjuvant, and including uh, medical oncology and radiation oncology and also uh, benign tumors uh, or non-malignant tumors, very common giant cell tumor. The secondary tumors, which really have um, exploded in terms of their, uh, their treatment uh, applicability in this day and age is metastatic carcinoma. And this, you know, obviously we come in as really secondary type uh, treatment providers um, in conjunction with medical and radiation um, oncology. We also treat um, serious infections. We do some of the big operations in orthopedics and general surgery, such as uh, different types of amputations. And do, we do also manage large bone loss in like trauma situations or uh, failed total joints. So just a, just a note before we talk about the real newest things in the field for uh, pediatric um, orthopedic oncology, osteosarcoma. And we've been, we've been working at this for, for several years, and now we have over a 20-year experience with expandable prostheses, you can see here, this is a, uh, a child, 11-year-old, who's going to have expected uh, probably uh, five or six centimeters of growth. And normally, these lesions occur in the distal femur. And we have to uh, deal with them um, in terms of you know, providing them with e equal growth to the other uh, extremity. And in these situations, we use these growing prostheses. And we've had a, quite a couple of decades of really good outcomes with these. And I just wanted to make sure everybody is, is still aware of that. 
In terms of innovations, um, really the two big things are navigation and 3D printing. Um, I know this 3D printing thing is a buzzword for all the tech people out there, but it's really been applied very, very uh, successfully to orthopedics and orthopedic oncology. In terms of navigation, these help us with intraoperative margins, especially in difficult uh, locations such as the spine and in uh, the pelvis. And 3D printing helps us with uh, making models of these tumors, cutting guides for surgery, and also implant design and fabrication. Here's an example. This is a case of a chondrosarcoma in a patient. We use the O-arm for navigation. Now, without navigation in this area, we'd have to take out the whole socket. We'd have to make the pelvis discontinuous. But with navigation, we can, we can really cut this down and do a, a very limited resection, keeping the pelvis um, in continuity and we do a more standard type of, of operation. So you can see we can just uh, literally carve out areas in the body to help us treat the patients more successfully. Now with models and 3D printing, models can help us to, to really get a, a 3D, 3D view of the tumor. My old mentors used to say, well, tumors don't read the textbook, but we can model them. So by modeling them, um, we can actually look at them, we can hold them in our hand. At the time of surgery, we can actually sterilize these and look at them in the operating room. In addition, we can get cutting guides made so that we don't necessarily have to rely only on intraoperative fluoroscopy or navigation to help us make these cuts like I showed you in that uh, first case. This is actually a, a case where we can actually use these uh, guides that we pin onto the bone and use to resect um, the tumor. Implant design and fabrication. Um, you know, the 3D modeling can be then used making a model of the actual implant and then the actual fabrication of the uh, titanium implant to be inserted. Now, other surgical considerations in metastatic bone disease, which is really, you know, very, very common in this day and age, and we're seeing more and more, are lesions of the pelvis. And these carry with it a very high complication rate. And we have to consider you know, anything that happens in the weight-bearing axis as being uh, you know, difficult. It keeps patients from ambulating, they're at bed rest. So we have to think about uh, internal fixation in these areas. Um, we have to have a structural filler. Um, we can use adjuvant therapy with them, with our radiation oncologists and medical oncologists. And so there's this relatively new system for the long bones. Now we've applied to the pelvis. It's called a photodynamic polymer. And what it is, it's like a, a sack. It's on a fiber optic kind of tube, and it has a little uh, plastic sack on it. And we fill it up with polymer. And in, intraoperatively, we actually will sensitize it with this ultraviolet light, and it hardens. And we can use this. We can introduce it in, in, into the pelvis, into areas of the skeleton in a very small incision. Patients can be in the hospital just for the day or overnight, where normally they'd spend a week with pelvic surgery. And we can put these photodynamic polymers in all the major areas of uh, the pelvis to help strengthen it. And here's just the case. This is how we, we do it intraoperatively. We use navigation as well. You can see this is the virtual image there. We, we decide on the trajectories of the implant, and then we put them in. Here's a case you can see. It's um, a destroyed uh, pelvis with acetabulum. And then this is intra-op. These are the two guide wires. So we place these photodynamic tubes down those guide wires under fluoroscopy. And you can see them, they look like little spirals. And then as we polymer in, they expand. You can see here. And we can also supplement it with a screw and cement. And then we, we light, up the, uh, light up the sky there. And then here it is uh, with a 3D model. So what it's actually doing is it's, it's, it's providing internal fixation into the, into the bone without open surgery. So in, you know, in, in conclusion, what we do in musculoskeletal oncology, it's a multi-specialty integration, uh, anesthesia, PM&R, radiology, pathology, medical oncology, plastics, peds oncology, and other orthopedic subspecialties all focused on successful patient outcomes. Thank you. Joe, thank you. That's um, really remarkable. Thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is Dr. Tony Beninato. Tony came from New York City. She was at Cornell after finishing her fellowship, and she is part of our endocrine surgery program. She's also the head of our Surgical Oncology Outcomes Research Group. And Tony has special expertise in the 
ability to analyze the large national databases that we frequently turn to, Vizient, NCDB, National Inpatient Sample, NISQIP, to understand the landscape of surgical care uh, in the United States. And she's done some very impactful work, and I'm, I'm looking forward to her presentation on her work in this arena. Tony, thank you. Good morning, thank you for having me. I'm an endocrine surgeon at Rutgers. Uh, what is an endocrine surgeon is a very common question I get. Um, I take care of patients with benign and malignant uh, problems with thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal glands. Um, so again, happy to, happy to be here. Um, I'm not gonna talk about technical surgical innovations, but I'm, I'm more gonna talk about a major problem in endocrine surgery, surgery which is an access to care problem. Um, so some of the work I've done has been looking at whether or not the Affordable Care Act, and I'll go into that a little bit, improved access to care uh, for patients with thyroid cancer. So first I want to start with some facts about disparities in thyroid cancer. White patients have nearly twice the incidence of thyroid cancer of African American patients. Patients with private insurance have six times the incidence of thyroid cancer of those with Medicaid or uninsured patients. And as is common with many other cancers, patients with low socioeconomic status present with more locally advanced and distant met metastatic disease. So most of the work that I've done has been focused on um, really insurance as a marker for socioeconomic status in patients with thyroid cancer. And this just shows that um, the treatment you get for thyroid cancer uh, which uh, at the time of this publication, the standard treatment for thyroid cancer was total thyroidectomy, plus or minus lymph node dissection, and the use of, of radioactive iodine treatment. Now use of those, each of those therapies, odds of receiving them is much higher if you have private insurance compared to patients with Medicare and Medicaid. And if you break this down by stage of disease, and we looked at this a bunch of different ways, these trends persist, which obviously shouldn't be. So in 2012, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was passed, and a key portion of the Affordable Care Act was the expansion of Medicaid eligibility criteria. And this expanded to all adults under 65 with income up to 138% of the federal poverty level. Um, and then, you know, after some lawsuits, decision was ultimately left up to individual states as to whether to adopt Medicaid expansion. Um, and the majority of the states that did expanded effective January 2014, uh, which leads to a nice way to examine this because you kind of have a group of states who did not expand Medicaid and a group of states that did. So you have a, a nice uh, control group and an intervention group. So we wanted to look at whether Medicaid expansion improved either, uh, was associated with a change in the diagnosis or uh, stage of diagnosis or treatment in patients with thyroid cancer. Uh, so we looked at the NCDB, the National Cancer Database, between 2010 and 2016, and we looked at insurance coverage, stage of diagnosis, uh, use of total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine treatment um, in states that expanded versus did not expand Medicaid in January 2014. So those two graphs to the right, the top one is states that did not expand Medicaid, and it, I know it's hard to see those lines, but each of those lines is different insurance, insurance types. So the top one is patients with private insurance, and then the ones at the bottom are Medicare, Medicaid, and uninsured. And you can see the bottom graph are states that expanded Medicaid, and you see that really that second line from the top, there was a, a big jump in Medicaid patients with thyroid cancer, and then you see the bottom line, a decrease in uninsured patients with thyroid cancer. So we're seeing that shift in uninsured patients to patients with Medicaid. So, you know, we found that Medicaid expansion states had a higher percentage of Medicaid patients with thyroid cancer. Um, but unfortunately, we saw no difference in stage at presentation. So one would expect that perhaps patients would present earlier, uh, have access to, to effective treatments, radioactive iodine. We didn't see any of, any of that as has been proven in, in other, um, other solid tumors. And I think some of the issues with these uh, differential treatment patterns in these patients have to do with access to high quality and high volume care. Uh, so we also looked at whether there was any change in um, access to highest volume centers in patients with thyroid cancer. And you could see in patients with thyroid cancer over the whole study period, the 
basically the worse insurance you have, the higher your odds of, of having surgery at a low volume center is. And then those with private insurance were most likely to have surgery at the highest volume centers and less likely to have surgery at a low volume center. So patients who are uninsured or have Medicaid um, have decreased access to high volume centers for thyroid cancers, which has been shown over and over again to have the best outcomes. We did look at this, um, look at Medicaid expansion, and this, this graph's a little difficult to see, but the take home from this is that in, in expansion states, odds of surgery at a lower volume center decreased after Medicaid expansion. So more patients with Medicaid were having surgery at high volume centers after Medicaid expansion. And we saw the opposite in non-expansion states. We saw that, um, that actually, for some reason, the odds of them having surgery at lower volume centers uh, became higher after Medicaid expansion. So, you know, still work to be done here, but, you know, in summary, and I could talk about this for, for an hour, but this was just a, a brief overview, but unfortunately, insurance status is associated with treatment use and overall survival in patients with papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, Medicaid expansion of the ACA was associated with um, an increased proportion of Medicaid patients undergoing thyroidectomy for cancer, which is great. Um, no change in stage of diagnosis or use of total thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine treatment in low-income patients, which is not so great. Proved access to high-volume centers, but no change in guideline concordant care. So even though we're, we seem to be uh, increasing access to these patients, uh, there's still a lot of work to do, and I hope to continue doing it. Thank you for having me. Tony, thank you. We're going to wait to uh, ask questions, have a discussion at the end if we have some time. Um, so I'm going to just move to our, our third speaker, Dr. James Akins. James uh, has been with us now, I'm going to say almost two years, James, maybe? Has it been? Close. Close to it. Uh, James is the head of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at the Cancer Institute here in New Brunswick and has a cadre of faculty that are just exceptional. Um, James has a particular, um, I want to say, reputation in the arena of, of graduate medical education. He started the only ACGME-approved fellowship in gynecologic oncology in the state of New Jersey about 10 years ago when he was at Cooper, under a very challenging kind of an ecosystem there without a lot of resources. And I'm very pleased to say that it looks like we're on the verge, I don't want to jinx it, of having another one opened here at the Rutgers Cancer Institute. <coughs> Congratulations, James. That's a great accomplishment. Thank you. <coughs> James will speak to us about advances in gynecologic oncology. James. Thank you. Um, good morning. I probably um, like to apologize for leaving my slide deck at home. Uh, so I'm going to try to do my best to explain briefly what I would have showed you here. Uh, probably I'll start off by saying that, you know, gynecologic oncology probably is still the unique gynecology, a uh, unique oncology specialty. Gynecologists have over the years been giving up things we used to do from breast to rectal cancers and everything else. And probably the only group of surgeons who still give chemotherapy. I know that of recent years, medical oncology is beginning to peck at our heels, but we're not gonna give that up. We're still gonna do chemo. It's important to us. Basically, what's new in GYN oncology? We, I think, ventured into most of the minimally invasive uh, procedures. Many people might not know that gynecologists were the ones who started laparoscopic surgery. I remember the days where we all practiced urologists and general surgeons to do cholecystectomy through the minimal invasive arena. We have perfected robotic surgery to the top. Today, we probably are performing over close to 300 minimally invasive procedures in New Brunswick, just the gynecologic oncology division. This gives me the segue to what I really want to talk about, which is clinical trial in one of our best um, attempt to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, we are looking at comparatively uh, individuals who have the BRCA1 mutation and as we all know, there's a high incidence of ovarian cancer, fallopian tube cancer, almost close to 50% in those patients. And with the previous standard of care recommendation of uh, bilateral sarpingophorectomy, we can reduce ovarian cancer, fallopian tube cancer, 
by almost 96 to 97% with those prophylactic surgeries. But of recent, uh, many, so a few studies have shown that almost half of those patients who are actually candidate for the risk-reducing surgery have you know, declined to go through that. And we think it's due to the fact that the risk of menopausal symptoms are so severe that most of these patients uh, decline to undergo such procedures. So comes up with this new non-randomized uh, studies, which is surgical, that we are doing, basically looking at women who self-select, those who want to just have fallopian tube um, resection versus those who want to have the classic BSO. We think that just convincing these young ladies between the ages of 35 and 50 who also have the mu positive mutation for BRCA1 actually will be a winner uh, so that not all of them will go through the menopausal symptoms that most young ladies are afraid to indulge in. At our center, this is done minimally. It's a minimal invasive procedure and the requirements are very uh, straightforward. Um, you have to have the BRCA positive uh, mutation. Uh, you will get a screening test with um, transvaginal ultrasound, CA125s. Um, you know, we exclude all patients who have had uh, malignancies or been treated for malignancy in less than a year. Um, if you're on hormonal therapy, you should not continue to be on it for at least three months. Um, and these are the patients that we are trying to recruit across the board. I will give a shout out to one of my colleagues who is our lead PI for the study. Dr. Gerda is here. Uh, I would like you all to try to reach out to her uh, because she's fantastic and uh, does a great job uh, for us in our division regarding clinical trials. So in essence, what I want to emphasize is that we are at the center of doing this um, research um, study, which I think at the end of the day is going to benefit a lot of women. Uh, let me just give a little bit background. I'm not going to be de too detailed. You know, all of this came about because some of us who are doing the BSO prophylactic surgery began to pick up these early fallopian tube cancers, what we call stick, serous tumor of intraepithelial uh, carcinomas. And uh, that led to the thinking that, you know, maybe ovarian cancer really starts from the fallopian tube, which actually most studies are beginning to confirm. So the idea of maybe taking out the tube completely may be the best approach, but no one has done the study to show the efficacy of this type of procedure, which is why we are embarking on this type of um, surgical uh, treatment. So I hope that please refer your BRCA1 patients to us and we'll do them justice. Thank you. James, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, since you oh, mentioned you. it, I'm just going to uh, take the liberty of just expanding on your comment about Dr. Gerda. So within the, within the Division of Surgical Oncology at the Rutgers Cancer Institute, we have gynecologic oncology, we have urologic oncology, and then we have general surgical oncology. And within general surgical oncology, we have four uh, formal sections, which include um, endocrine, melanoma sarcoma, GI, and breast. We are focused on advancing and promoting our program in clinical research, and Dr. Gerda has just recently accepted a leadership position as the Associate Chief Surgical Officer for Research. So, Jane, thank you very much for that, and we're looking forward to your expertise in helping us. So, I didn't intend for this to happen this way, but we're going from north to south, apparently, in uh, our speaker presentation. So, we now have two speakers from the southern region of our system. And the first one that I'm going to introduce is Dr. Richard Lazaro, who's a thoracic surgeon and the head of the thoracic surgical program for the southern region. We are leaning on Richard a lot uh, across the entire system to help us with respect to uh, invigorating and developing a, a broad thoracic surgery program uh, throughout our entire northern, central, and southern region. And so we're really excited to have him here. I'm just going to mention one thing, Rich. So Rich Lazaro was at um, a hospital in Manhattan, I think it was Lenox Hill, am I correct? And really built a nationally recognized program in thoracic oncology in the backyard 
of Memorial Sloan Kettering, Columbia, Cornell, Mount Sinai, and NYU, uh, to the point where he had one of the busiest programs, uh, if not the busiest, in the city of New York. And, and it's really a remarkable achievement. And so if you have the secret recipe for that, then I hope it will work here in the southern region, Rich. We're delighted to have you. And he's going to talk to us about advances in thoracic oncology. Thank you, very, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I don't know if I have any secret sauce except to say I'm from Brooklyn, so <laughs> somewhat tenacious. have older brothers, so I know how to follow the lead, but don't do it. My brothers or my dad does, so I know how to go down an independent path and realize that whatever it is that we do, you know, when you're, you don't have the information, you don't make good decisions. So try to share the, the things that are important to a surgeon. So I have nothing to disclose. You know, surgeons really need to understand advances. That uh, the, the optimal management for lung cancer is multimodality therapy, and I think presentation multidisciplinary tumor boards allows you to glean knowledge and insight from your pathology colleagues, uh, your medical oncology colleagues, your radiation oncology colleagues. But if you go back 20 years, we were just talking about histopathology. And now we're really talking about molecular pathology to make great decisions. And we know that uh, in some of our patients that the Adoro trial demonstrated improved survival on appropriate patients that we resect. You know, we also know that the adjuvant uh, addition of immunotherapy in people with PDL1 greater than 1% after completely resected lung cancer is super powerful and the survival curves demonstrate that. And we need to know that because we need to counsel our patients and they're going to listen to us. And we also need to understand that, you know, surgery as first-line therapy may not be just the only way to go and we need to understand which patients would benefit from neoadjuvant immunochemo, really understanding that the benefit is downstaging and that utilization of this type of regimen demonstrated an improvement, complete pathologic response from about 2.2% with chemotherapy alone to about 24.4% with the induction of immunotherapy as a new adjuvant strategy and that complete pathologic response really connotes a survival benefit and we really need to be able to work with our colleagues about circulating tumor DNA as a marker for surrogate of survivorship and maybe times to intervene if we think that predates a, a radiologic and clinical uh, recurrence. So survival curves were outstanding, and that's the data we were just talking about. But more importantly, we don't know everything, so we really need to understand how to sequence these therapies, and that's why I think multidisciplinary tumor boards are hugely important. But ultimately, we're surgeons, so we got to get valued for what we do in the operating room, and I don't like the bell-shaped curve. It's great. I just think that everybody trains the same way and we need to leverage technology and maybe augmented reality and development of smart instruments so that instead of having you know, the top 1% of people performing surgery, we have to have 99% of the people performing surgery at the top 1% of outcomes. And you leverage that by trying to develop a almost ways map of surgery and smart instrumentation. Now, Lung surgery started out really with the first pneumonectomy as a single stage procedure on April 5th, 1933 in St. Louis by Everett's Graham for what turned out to be a stage two squamous cell carcinoma with the patient leaving, living approximately 25 years and longer than the surgeon. It took three decades to prove that pneumonectomy uh, was an appropriate procedure, but lobectomy had equivalent survival and less complications. And in 1995, the Lung Cancer Study Group demonstrated that lobectomy was superior to wedge or seg sublobar resection anatomic segmentectomy because there was a threefold higher local recurrence rate, and that transferred into a decreased survival. But this year, two pivotal studies really came out. This is from the Japanese Cooperative Oncology Group looking at early cancers, so stage one. And you know the key to those data about you know, decreased incidence, uh, improved survivorship with lung cancer is really all about PST, there is no D, 
but it's prevention, smoking cessation, it's screening, it's finding lung cancers early, and then it's treatment. And from my standpoint, it's the appropriate sequencing, it's the molecular pathology, and then finally it's the execution of sub-lobar resections. Not the easy ones, but the more complex segments that most people don't know how to do. And this is a fantastic study published about six months ago. And again, at, at World Lung this year, the, the, the CALGB study by Nasser al Torki demonstrated similar findings, which really translated into survival curves that favored segmentectomy over lobectomy for these early patients. So the data is great. These are the, this is the important paper, excellent survival, hazard ratios favoring segmentectomy over lobectomy. So we need to embrace screening, we need to get cancers earlier, we need to do tumor boards. So when I think about that just briefly, post-screening we should get a bunch more patients with stage one disease, and that obviously translates into improved survival. So similar message. We need to understand and work with our radiologists that when we find tumors, we need to objectify them in terms of radiomics, and we need to be able to look at things at consolidation to tumor ratios so that if we're observing a, a non-solid nodule and we get the development of part of that nodule being solid, then we need to be able to look at that consolidation to tumor ratio to understand that it increases the invasiveness of the cancer and the likelihood of lymph nodes and, and worse survival. So we need to get to these patients earlier. But when I look at you know that picture C in there, I'm seeing bubbly lucencies, part solid nodule. And we need our computers to put a mark on that and give us an objective non-interpreter uh, measurement of the pretest probability of malignancy so that we can make the appropriate determination. So, Specific indications for segmentectomy used to include just people of poor cardiac and pulmonary reserve, but that is no longer the case. When we do these procedures, we have to not compromise the oncologic efficacy of it. We have to do more minimally invasive procedures, and it's interesting if you go back to that Checkmate 816 trial after induction immunotherapy with chemotherapy, there was more pathologic complete response, there were more procedures in the immunotherapy arm that were performed minimally invasive, and there were more or, or less pneumonectomies that were required. This is a great reference to kind of talk about segments, but um, at the end of the day, um, when I, I look at anatomic uh, segments, I'm looking at the, the image on the left is a scan that demonstrates the axial images over a cranial to caudad, but that might not give me the appropriate um, understanding of where that nodule is. So we're using advanced imaging to be able to stack those images, make a princess lay a hologram, be able to put marks on the arteries, the veins, the nodule, and utilize reconstruction, not just for 3D uh, printing, but with the thought of can we get a superimposable roadmap of what the anatomy looks like so that people can drive an anatomic resection, and I think we're leading the way with that. Robotic segments, again, taking imaging, you know, has a, a, almost trying to think long-term self-driving cars. Um, but we use those images to kind of understand what are the external landmarks of internal anatomy so that we can drive our operation and our port placement to perform that operation. And this is another case of advanced imaging where we're just preoperative planning. I sit on some committee with the American College of Surgeons that has a lot to do with preoperative planning. And nevertheless, you know, when we do a segment, and sorry, it's early in the morning, it's really about preemptive analgesia. Why do we do that? Because we know that that done up front decreases narcotic requirements. Narcotic requirements, the more morphine equivalents you use with uh, lung resection, you sort of block a mu receptor on your natural killer cells, worse five-year survival. So we're really very uh, much in tune with uh, doing preemptive analgesia. The, the benefit of the robot is scaled motion. The instrument in my right hand is two millimeters in width. We're using energy and we're dissecting out anatomy with the lower lobe towards the right, the upper lobe towards nine o'clock. And we're taking out lymph nodes in order to perform this. Uh, I don't know if I can roll through the procedure, but we're gonna use that, that 
uh, picture in picture, superimposed uh, the anatomy. The artery towards the top was the, uh, the A6 artery. And this is A9 to the ninth segment of the lower lobe. We're putting a bulldog clamp on it. And what we're gonna do is occlude that artery. We're gonna give an injection of something that's called ICG that autofluoresces when you change your white light in order to be able to see the, the demarcation of the lung um, using near-infrared uh, fluorescent imaging. And this is us just being able to risk the benefit of the robot was, in essence, what we're gonna try to do with the surgery across our system is to do remote telepresence proctoring. So if someone's having a challenging case up north, Maybe uh, I can log in from my robotic uh, platform down in the southern region and be able to you know, assist that surgeon remotely as long as they're at the field. And this is the bulldog, and, and you'll see here that we'll use some Firefly, and I'll move past this once we see the go green um, aspect of this. Um, but phenomenal tools, and there it is. You know, uh, A little bit further along, we're gonna demonstrate more of the demarcation uh, but for what we do, it, it's really about um, working with our teammates, knowing the literature, fundamentally valued for what we do, break down the procedures into creation of fissures, removal of nodes, getting into the appropriate plane around the pulmonary artery, teaching our peers how to do that. And we know from, from participating in the world's largest um, paper on uh, robotic lobectomy, where we were the number one contributor, the bottom line is robotic surgery is safe, it's reproducible, it has outcomes as good as any other approach, and segments is what we should be doing now, and we're gonna be the system that drives imaging to make surgery safer here, but beyond our region. Thank you very much. We just start, we have one more speaker, and uh, uh, I know we're a few minutes behind, but we're gonna, um, Take, a, take five more minutes because I, I want to complete a really ambitious and, and I think informative program here, but I hope that the prevailing theme that all of you are taking away from all of these presentations is the incredible integration of surgical, uh, surgical techniques into the management of the patient with cancer based on molecular biology, based on incredible advances in instrumentation and, and computational uh, capacities, as well as the application of surgery for the treatment of metastatic cancer and the application of surgery to prevent cancer. It's an incredible time to be involved in surgical oncology because of all of these advances. And I think this will be highlighted by our last speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Preeti Kohli, who is the Director of Breast Surgery at Monmouth Medical Center. I share an office with her down in Monmouth, and she's going to talk to us about advances in, in, in breast surgery. Preeti. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and I'll try and speed through this to catch up, and I'm gonna stand here because I'm short. Um, so, you know, breast cancer, it's very prevalent. I don't need to tell all of you that. What has changed over time? So when mammography was first implemented in the 60s, um, we were finding breast cancer as a clinically detected lump. All of them were invasive. We were diagnosing them at the time of surgery Surgery was quite extensive, involving extensive lymph node dissection, which had a high rate of lymphedema development. And all patients essentially got chemotherapy, radiation, radical mastectomy, and there were no reconstructive options. A lot has changed where we're finding these cancers with screen detection, early stages. We're tailoring the treatments around the biology of the tumors and really trying to uh, minimize the side effects of care while providing great outcomes. And the survival rates for breast cancer are continuing to improve each year. And there are currently over four million breast cancer survivors in the US. It is the single fastest growing group of survivors. So we need to start thinking of what life looks like for these patients after their cancer care. So 
you know, I won't go into too much of this, but you know, all of the changes really started with NSABP 04, which showed that there really wasn't a great improvement in disease-free survival in patients who underwent mastectomy versus lumpectomy, provided they received radiation afterwards. So that allowed us to start tailoring the plans to the individual needs of the patient. So previously, these were lumpectomy results, and I want to highlight those are not my results. Um, but you can see it is less than ideal cosmesis. And although you could have a patient you know, survive their breast cancer diagnosis, it's a constant reminder of their, their battle. There's reduced body confidence. It affects the relationships long term. And these are all surrogates for quality of life. So newer surgical techniques when it comes to breast conserving surgery. We can do lumpectomy followed by fat grafting. We can do lumpectomy with oncoplastic techniques, which are oncologically safe principles, which are also applying plastic surgery principles to retain a more natural shape to the breast. So here's one example of a patient who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. She had lumpectomy, and she had local tissue rearrangement oncoplasty. Very symmetrical result the main evidence of which side she was treated on is actually with the evidence of her um, skin lesions that became more prominent with radiation treatment. This is another case. This was a patient who was told elsewhere that they needed mastectomy because they had two tumors in that inner quadrant of the breast. That is not a contraindication to breast conserving surgery. However, we offered her a surgery in a breast reduction fashion. So she was able to have the tumors removed with wide margins and a contralateral symmetry procedure, which is covered by insurance, of course. So how are we making lumpectomies better? It starts with what we do, not only before surgery, but in the OR. When I'm doing a lumpectomy, we used to have to send the specimen to radiology, image it, and having an intraoperative specimen x-ray unit is very, very helpful because your surgical time is shorter, you're not pancaking the specimens with these faxatron boards, and less pancaking of the specimen by the time it gets to pathology means potentially fewer surgical margin issues and a lower re-excision rate. Um, so with this, I can in real time rotate the specimen, get multiple views in all the different dimensions and discuss the results with the radiologist while the patient is asleep. And if needed, I can re-excise a margin right then and there. When it's a non-palpable breast lesion, we you know, don't wanna just do quadrantectomy. Previously, you had two views of the mammography, a craniocaudal, mediolateral, and you would localize it to one quadrant of the breast. And we can do better than that, because that means you're taking a lot of unnecessary healthy tissue. So localization was first performed with wire localization or needle localization, and now we have many non wire localization methods. Savvy Scout, uh, what we use at, Ma at Monmouth is MagSeed, and MagSeed is a non-radioactive wireless localization device which can be implanted prior to surgery. If a patient needs neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it can be left in place throughout their chemotherapy, and even if there's no evidence of that tumor anymore after their treatment, we still know where this lesion is because it's been marked with the MagSeed. So we find it with a probe, um, that has potential to lower the duration of the day of surgery because the patient's not getting a separate procedure prior to their lumpectomy with, with the breast center doing a needle localization. And the, the nice thing about this probe in particular for MagSeed is that it is a single probe that can also be used to identify a lymph node marked with MagTrace, which I'll go into. Now, we can't always do a lumpectomy on patients, and um, sometimes we can try and shrink a tumor down and make, it, uh, make someone who's only a mastectomy candidate a lumpectomy candidate with neoadjuvant treatment, but sometimes there are other reasons why you simply can't do it. And so with mastectomy, we, we have simple mastectomy as an option, and it's a patient's choice and right to have reconstruction. Some patients feel most comfortable not having reconstruction, and we have a lot of options with prosthetics, covering the area with tattoos, and that's a safe option, but reconstruction is also safe. 
With skin sparing mastectomy, we know that it's safe to spare all of the skin, the skin envelope of the breast, and we remove that breast tissue, the glandular tissue, and the nipple areolar complex while saving the rest of the skin. When we reconstruct the breast, it allows for a very natural result. And these are results of nipple reconstruction um, and nipple tattooing. So the plastic surgeon will then reconstruct the nipple to provide an actual profile to the, the breast that's very natural. And the techniques with tattooing have become pretty remarkable that sometimes you don't even need the, the 3D reconstruction because the tattooing is so natural looking, you really can't tell that it's not the patient's native nipple areolar complex. Uh, these are some of the results to know what our patients actually look like. These are all patients from our community. This is a patient who had bilateral mastectomy with a deep flap reconstruction and nipple reconstruction. So you can see that's a very natural result, and she had the, the bonus of having essentially a tummy tuck at the time of her reconstruction. Now, hidden scar nipple sparing mastectomy is one of the, the newer techniques which, you know, is definitely gonna provide a more superior cosmetic outcome. Of course, there are oncologic considerations and anatomic considerations in selecting patients for this type of procedure, but it can reduce the stages of reconstruction, and it has been proven again and again to be oncologically safe. The nipple is just another margin with similar recurrence rates to the skin elsewhere in the breast, provided you're doing a thorough job of actually coring out that nipple and taking the ductal tissue out of it. These are results of our patients who have had nipple sparing mastectomy. This is implant-based reconstruction. And these are patients who, this is a patient who had nipple sparing bilateral mastectomy with immediate deep flap reconstruction. Very natural results and again, highlights how a patient can undergo a large surgery like this and still have a very natural result long-term and not feel less than. So not just breast management, but breast surgeons, we also are in charge of the nodal management, and we have really pushed things uh, from axillary node dissection to sentinel lymph node biopsy, even when patients had a biopsy-proven lymph node, doing targeted node dissection, where we're removing a previously involved lymph node to see if we can de-escalate nodal management, and even in certain populations, omission of the sentinel lymph node biopsy altogether, and now that we have MagTrace at our institution, delayed sentinel lymph node biopsy with MagTrace. MagTrace is an iron oxide that's injected in the breast prior to mastectomy before we're disrupting those lymphatics. It marks the lymph node for up to four weeks and allows us to see if that patient who had DCIS or is, is high risk to find out, do they have something invasive in their pathology that warrants that node excision, because even one sentinel lymph node can lead to lymphedema. So it's retained in the lymph node for four weeks. We can go back with making an informed decision with the patient to remove that lymph node if needed. It's in most cases not needed, and the, the sequelae of that is that the iron oxide just washes out and goes to the patient's natural iron stores. If we do need to do a more extensive node dissection, we really want to be aware of breast cancer-related lymphedema. This is its a real entity. These patients have reduced quality of life, and there are a lot of healthcare-related needs associated with lymphedema. There's cellulitis. There are a lot of you know, interventions needed, whether it's pneumatic pumps or sleeves. So what we want to do is you know, previously, the only way to really determine if someone had lymphedema was by finding out that they had a swollen arm, they reported heaviness, and you would do tape measurements with a measuring tape. That led to a lot of variability based on who's doing the tape measurements, and you're only finding them when they're in an advanced stage of lymphedema because they're symptomatic. What we now use at Monmouth is bioimpedance spectroscopy. This is a non-invasive way of detecting very minute volumes of fluid in the extremity. We do a baseline measurement prior to surgery or any nodal intervention, and we use this as the vital sign of breast care. Every time that patient comes in and they're getting their vitals, we're also doing a SOZO measurement and getting that bioimpedance spectroscopy. We're able to detect about two tablespoons of fluid in an extremity 
With this, we're finding subclinical lymphedema. When you find subclinical lymphedema, it is reversible with four weeks of a compression sleeve, 12 hours a day. So not a huge intervention, and you can really focus on doing the right thing for the patient from an oncologic standpoint while minimizing those long-term issues associated with the surgery. If you do have to have, you know, you find a patient who was treated elsewhere, they come in with that swollen arm. We do have advanced techniques for managing those higher stages of lymphedema, like lymphovenous anastomosis, lymph node transplant, and there are several clinical trials looking at reverse lymphatic mapping to try and find out which are the, the prime lymphatics of the arm and avoiding them. And I also just want to highlight that these surgeries, even if it's a big surgery like bilateral mastectomy, patients were previously in the hospital for days on a, on a pain pump, PCA, a lot of narcotic use, a lot of pain. It is now not only a less disfiguring surgery, but the recovery is much better with our ARES protocols. This was one published in JAX with our chair of plastic surgery, who's actually now the president of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. So I'm very, very proud to have him at our institute Dr. Gregory Greco, we published this modality that, you know, this multimodality protocol using gabapentin, ketamine, and, and Exporel. And what we found is that um, nearly a third of these patients had a zero narcotic recovery. And in this opioid epidemic, that's very, very important. And finally, you all know that we don't have to give chemotherapy to everyone. Now we know the biology of, you know, these breast cancers and can tailor the treatments. Uh, but when patients do require chemotherapy, and, and granted, I'm not a medical oncologist, but this is one thing I'm very proud of, which is also focusing on that quality of care for the patient, is that we do have scalp cooling for our patients. So scalp cooling is used for these patients when they require chemotherapy. This is a picture of one of my patients who had just finished chemotherapy, and you can see she has a full head of hair. Granted, those results are not consistent because there's variability with hair density and chemotherapy regimen, but it's a great option. And it's nice to see that we can think of all the different aspects other than just a number of the survival rate. So these oncologic outcomes continue to improve. We want to we wanna focus on the quality of care we're providing and those long-term outcomes and really pave the way for a successful survivorship. Thank you all for having me. Tremendous presentations. I want to thank all of our panelists this morning. We'll, we'll have discussions during lunchtime, I think, out in the back for anyone who's interested to carry on with uh, any of our speakers today. Uh, so I'll just turn it over to Howard now for the next section of our program.